time, permitting them to perceive the direction of a scent. Once they pick up the scent, it dissolves on their wet nose. These liquefied molecules are then pushed further back into the snout. The dog devotes 40 times more of its brain power to smell than we do. A dog's nose contains about 60 square inches of scent receptors, called the epithelium. That's about the size of an 8.5 by 11 inch piece of paper. If you compared our scent receptor area, you would find it is a little smaller than a postage stamp. Amazingly, we've managed to take the great wolf nose and make it better. Yeah, they're, uh, they're on the move out there. Really. Scent discrimination is part of obedience trials. Send your dog. Using its incredible sense of smell, the dog's task is to locate the one object on the field that its owner has handled. Through careful breeding, we created the Bloodhound Nose, complete with 300 million olfactory sensors. Even the Dachshund has 125 million. And the Beagle packs in 225 million scent receptors in its nose. We have 96 different breeds of scent hounds, dogs specifically created by us over the years for their exceptional sense of smell. And today, people use a dog's keen sense of smell in many ways. If an object has an odor, a dog can be trained to identify it and find it. And Dr. Giovanni Morsiani's dogs do just that. I like to present you the king of the table, the truffle. You can see how magnificent they are, that bowl of uh, uh, white and uh, uh, black truffle that the Lagotto Romagnolo find here in Bagnara di Romagna. It turns out that a dog's keen sense of smell is perfectly suited for sniffing out these subterranean delicacies. And the dog of choice for Italian truffle hunters is the Lagotto Romagnolo. They nearly died out as a breed, but in the 1970s, Dr. Morsiani was one of four Italian dog lovers that brought the dogs back from the edge of extinction. Truffle hunting dogs have been used for centuries to sniff out and find truffles in Italy and France. Truffles can sell for thousands of dollars. The record price was set in 2007 when a truffle weighing a little over three pounds was sold for $330,000. Truffles have been collected for at least 3,600 years. Their attraction is a tantalizing taste and aroma, and it is said that once experienced, can never be forgotten. Historically, both pigs and dogs have been used to find truffles. In Italy, dogs are preferred, because pigs will eat truffles. Dogs won't. Every year, truffle hunters in Italy take to the woods hoping that the sensitive noses of their trained dogs will lead them to buried treasure. Finding truffles is a game for the dogs, and they're given a treat each time they find one. The night before a truffle hunt, the dogs aren't fed, so they'll be eager to find truffles for the treats. When hunting for truffles, a good dog proceeds slowly, sniffing and backtracking. Suddenly, it will drop its nose to the ground, inhale deeply, and then dig in with its front paws. Many dog owners experience the frustration of their dog leaving the backyard looking like a moonscape. Here, dogs are rewarded for being diligent diggers. The handler stops his dog before its nails ruin the truffles.
truffle hunting dogs are so prized that competing human truffle hunters sometimes dog nap them. Anything to get an edge. This basket holds about $10,000 worth of truffles. Not bad for an afternoon's outing. And now we are going to eat a very, very special food. Pasta. Tortelloni Romagnoli with truffles. When it comes to plucking this musty jewel, nothing beats the power of the nose. Next to smell, the sense of hearing is the most acute of a wolf's senses. Wolves can hear as far away as six miles in the forest and 10 miles in the open. Our modern dogs inherited their great sense of hearing from the wolf. As newborns, a puppy's ear flaps are not movable and their ear canals are sealed. They are deaf. Their ears don't begin to open until they're about two weeks old. By the end of the first month, the puppy's hearing is acute. They are able to detect the direction that a sound comes from, and just like us, they learn to screen out a lot of background noise. These are important skills because, as adults, these dogs will sleep through blaring stereos or honking cars. But open a bag of dog food, and they're wide awake. Dog ears come in an amazing variety. Extremely long and floppy, small, soft, and perked, or folding elegantly alongside the face. It's the pinna that's the outer, visible part of a dog's ear. Dogs are able to tilt, turn, raise, and lower their ears to locate not only the sound, but pinpoint the exact origin and accurately interpret whether it is threatening or not. The frequencies that dogs hear are nearly twice what we do, and they can pick up and distinguish sounds roughly four times the distance we can. At the outer edge of the ear is the ear flap. The flap funnels the sound through the ear canal to the tympanic membrane, or eardrum. Inside the eardrum are three small bones that increase the intensity of sound vibrations. The vibrations enter the spiral-shaped cochlea, which converts them into signals that are then delivered to the brain. And all this happens in six hundredths of a second. But what has proved to be the most important thing a dog can hear is the sound of the human voice. Hands up. Step. Dog's ears are exquisitely tuned to the tone pitch and rhythm of our voices. These are non-verbal cues that reveal our emotions and intentions to our dogs. Up, switch. Nice, very nice. Ready? Let's go. Okay, Becky, pull. That ability to understand us allows companion dogs to enhance the independence and quality of life okay, of their stop. disabled partners. Becky, stop. And this partnership is built on the human voice. But just understanding our voice might not mean much without a dog's willingness to do things for us. Dogs have not only learned to listen to our voice, today there are some that can feel the emotion of our hearts. The Golden Retriever is one of the breeds we originally created to help us hunt. And even though most of us no longer hunt, the Golden has never stopped wanting to please us. Today, they're often found in service as companion dogs. This is Tuesday, 
and his best friend, Luis Montalvan. Luis is a former army captain and decorated veteran who served two tours in Iraq. For four years, he was surrounded by violence and death. When you're in the profession of combat arms, you're expected to be tough and, and deal with it and take care of your soldiers. And I really neglected to take care of myself. Luis came home with a serious spinal injury and psychic scars that tormented him day and night. You know, transitioning out of the military is, is, it can be a diff difficult thing. Um, I mean, I'd been in the military a long time, and um, coming to New York, I'd never lived in New York. Um, this is a, I mean, it's New York. Trying to rebuild his life on his own was a real challenge. In 2008, the promise of help arrived in an email from the Wounded Warrior Project, which offered to pair veterans with mental and physical disabilities with trained service dogs. Well, the latter portion of 2008, I got Tuesday, and he, he has been, I mean, a, a godsend. Tuesday, stand. Good boy. Look, get my shoes. That's it. Good boy, bring it here. Tuesday's retrieval talents spare Luis painful bending and lifting. Good boy. Look, go get the other one. Such a good boy. Oh, good boy. Yes. You're so good. Such a good puppy. He helps me with balance. I've had some issues with balance where before I, before I got him, I fell. I fell down a flight of subway steps. It was pretty bad. So he offers me um, a sense of equilibrium as I walk that's tremendously helpful. Easy. Step. Good boy. And once in the subway, Tuesday helps Luis keep his mental balance. There are a lot of people around, and it, it, uh, it's unnerving because it reminds me of some Boy. incident in Iraq. Psychiatric service dogs are trained to recognize changes in a person's breathing, perspiration, or scent that can signal the onset of a flashback or panic attack. He'll tilt his head back and look at me and, and sort of smile and, and maybe lick me and ask me to pet him and it, it takes me out of the past and it brings me into the present. I feel better about going out. By keeping Luis from dwelling on memories of Iraq and in the present, Tuesday gets him to the VA and to his graduate journalism classes at Columbia. But Tuesday is far more than a well-trained therapist. He's a great dog. And just by being a great dog, he can unleash oxytocin in all who return his loving gaze. Tuesday is beloved at, uh, at Columbia, and, and he's beloved at the VA. Veterans love to see him. He, he says hello, and he, he has a remarkable way of changing their disposition. Um, and they even just say that, you know, I'm, I, I feel so much better now. Down. Good boy. Belly. Oh, you should have watched your belly. Oh. He has allowed me to get out of my apartment, you know, where I used to spend an inordinate amount of time alone, stewing in my thoughts. He, you know, he's a dog, he needs to go out. And at the end of their long days, Tuesday even reminds Luis to take his medicine. Good boy. With Tuesday curled up next to him, Luis is able to fall into a healing sleep knowing that Tuesday will wake him at the slightest hint of a nightmare. And so, our long, long journey with the dog finds us back at the beginning, when they protected us from dangers beyond our campfires. Only now, we're asking them to protect us from enemies within. The camp wolves that gambled on humans made a very good bet. Here in the United States, we share